some small breakouts at the, at the front of the room so that you get to interact more fully with our presenters. So if you're intending on listening, if you could be in the front two rows, I'd very much appreciate that. Oh, that's a correct presentation, but it doesn't show on the screen. Okay, we're just sorting out an issue with the presentations, and uh, when we get things up on the screen, we can begin the session. I know we're still waiting for people to come in from lunch. And as I was saying, that if you're going to be interacting in the session, listening, if we could come down to the first two rows, we'll be able to have much better interaction. Thank you. Okay, uh, assalamu alaikum, bonjour, hello, and welcome to the session on evolution of national evaluation systems. We've got four great presentations for you here this afternoon. So we're, we're looking to send out the conference with a bang, with a bit of excitement and a bit of uh, interest in thinking about how people's experience of ev evaluation systems is uh, evolving. So I'm just going to ask the panelists to just introduce themselves quickly, and then we're going to move on to our first presenter. And another ask, if you're towards the back and you're listening, could you move down to the front two rows of tables, because we're going to have some interaction after we've had presentations. So I'd like to start with Heba. Could you introduce yourself there, please? Um, I'm uh, Dr. Heba Gamali Dean. I'm assistant professor from Institute of National Planning in Egypt. Um, I am specialized in future studies and public policy affairs, and uh, uh, I talk a lot of uh, or f four uh, research awards. The last one in future studies from Morocco, one of them from the Arab League. Um, also, uh, I have uh, about 15 years' experience in civil society as a consultant uh, in Egypt and the Arab world. And also, um, I have uh, the pleasure um, that uh, to address a paper about think tanks, which is uh, I got my PhD on think tanks uh, and its role in public policy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Madina Osbuhud. I am from the kingdom of Lesotho. I work for the Ministry of Development Planning in specifically in the Department of National Monitoring and Evaluation. Uh, we coordinate uh, the National Monitoring and Evaluation System and we support the ministries uh, in their monitoring and evaluation. Uh, but before working for the Ministry of Development Planning, I have worked in different sectors like agriculture, 
natural resources and mining. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Stephen Porter. I'm the facilitator for the session. I work at the World Bank as a evaluation strategy advisor. Prior to working there, I've worked at Oxfam, uh, DFID, and at a university in South Africa, where I implemented a center called CLEAR. So I'm going to hand over now. Thank you very much, Stephen. My name is Balsama Shwai, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I work for the Ministry of Development Planning uh, in the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation, Masaru Lesotho. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nox Chitepo. I work in the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation um, in South Africa. It's a department that is attached to the presidency. Uh, and I work specifically in the evaluations unit. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear participant. Uh, I am Mustafa Tolibov. I am from Tajikistan. I am working at Central Statistic Republic of Tajikistan as the main specialist summary economic and analysis international relations department. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and now we're going to start with our first discussant, uh, Nox Chitepo from South Africa. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where we come from in terms of our evaluation system in South Africa and where we are at currently. But first, I wanted to just um, uh, indicate that we did not have a legislation that supported evaluation. So the approach in which we were going to do evaluations was very important in the country. We needed to make sure that everybody was coming and working with us. So our approach to, to how we did evaluations was one where we decided to work on a cooperation um, kind of approach. So we used, um, it was a utilization focused approach in which we made sure that when we work with the departments, we co-develop um, the concept for the evaluation that we wanted to undertake. We made sure that we do co-funding, so it was an incentive to make sure that the departments would be interested as well in, in, in doing the evaluation. Um, we made sure that the owners of the program, for example, sat in our steering committees and chaired the steering committees. So this was a way of incentivizing the, the departments to do evaluations. But more than that, we tabled our evaluations at cabinet. We thought that in this way, we elevate programs and people make sure that we, the recommendations go to cabinet level and can be heard by the ministers at cabinet level. And to ensure credibility of our evaluations, we, we had a peer reviewing system. So for every evaluation that we conduct, we make sure that there's a peer reviewer who looks at the methodology and a peer reviewer who's a specialist in the field. Um, we had validation workshops that we would undertake where we call all the stakeholders who were participating in the evaluation. So it was a very participatory kind of approach to make sure that the uh, participants in the evaluation are validating the findings and validating and accepting the recommendations. So how we are structured um, in the unit, in case you are interested, we have four different directorates, and each of the directorates is responsible for evaluations in a particular sector, but more than that, to ensure institutionalization, there's a directorate that's responsible for capacity, capacity building, um, that's training, development of courses, there's a directorate that's responsible for communication, which would include developing annual reports every year to report on evaluation findings, quarterly reports, policy briefs, um, brown bag lunches. So that's the communication aspect, just to make sure that we, we are communicating the findings as, wide, as wide, widely as possible. And then um, there's a directorate that's also responsible for institutionalization tools. So that is a direct directorate responsible for developing guidelines, for developing concept notes, for um, 
uh, what else do they do? Templates, because, you know, for, because for every step of the evaluation process, we have a guideline to make sure that it's common, the language is common amongst, um, amongst the users. So we've had some key accomplishments over time, over um, since 2011, because 2011 is when our national evaluation policy framework was adopted by cabinet. So how have we done? We've done some great things. We, some things are, are, are still needing to be worked on. So our evaluation system we found has gained a lot of traction, both nationally and provincially such that what we have done now, because we are feeling a little bit confident in the system, is that we are taking our evaluation system to the local sphere, which is local government where services are, are being implemented at the, at the main. Um, some of our evaluations uh, have had improvements that have changed policies, so that is, we feel is very key because a, an evaluation that is not used is as useless as the paper that it's written on, right? Um, we've got, we've had a seven year multi, uh, a seven multi year national evaluation plan. So every year we table our evaluation plan at cabinet to make sure that all the ministers understand the evaluations that are going to be done as part of them acknowledging when the reports come back for recommendations and implementation of recommendations. We've had a very successful advisory panel that uh, is across the departments. Uh, we call it the Evaluation Technical Working Group who are responsible for selecting the evaluations, who provide guidance in terms of, 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 of uh, development of any um, tools that we have. We've got nine provinces, and currently eight of those nine provinces have got provincial evaluation plans, and um, 61 departments have got de departmental evaluation plans because we make sure that the departments as well have got evaluation plans. We've got, um, we've done eight courses, and we've trained. So one of our sex successful um, training has been the training of DGs, which in some countries you call uh, PS, right? So where we train at... No, I say Director General. Oh, okay. Sorry? Director General. Yes, D Director Generals, yes, who, who are called uh, uh, PSs in other countries. So we've, we do training at that level because we realize that if, because they report directly to ministers, so if you can influence at that level, then you've got people who are actually your champions to the politicians, and that way we are trying to, to, to make sure that we get the, we, we, the, the culture across. Um, we've developed guidelines as, as the department that other departments use when they do evaluation. So our guidelines start from how you write a TOR, uh, how you communicate results, how you have a validation workshop. It's a guideline literally step by step in terms of conducting um, evaluations. We've done well in terms of uh, communication of our findings. Um, and so the big thing as part of this evolution is that, and true to being evaluators, we evaluated the evaluation system in itself to see whether we are having the right uh, impact in terms of how evaluations are conducted in the country. I didn't have time to put the findings, because uh, Stephen has been strict on me, but I'll just point to a couple of the recommendations that have come up. So there is an encouragement, there's an appetite that the evaluation should be embedded in legislation, but that takes long. So we became a little bit smart with that. Our planning framework is regulated. So what we did, we latched onto the planning framework and we included evaluations there because then every time they report on planning, which is quarterly, um, then they also report on evaluations. Uh, the role of impact evaluations needs to be strengthened. We've had very, very few impact evaluations, actually less than five, if I must be that clear. So that has come across. Re our evaluations were also then taking very long, so we introduced rapid, a rapid uh, um, evaluation guideline 
as a response to that to make sure that we are responding very quickly because sometimes we are called to do uh, some rapid assessments. So we've developed a guideline in that regard. Uh, we've been um, called on to strengthen our investment in capacity. There's still a lot of capacity constraints in undertaking evaluations. Um, and we've also been called on to, to, to do more in terms of um, communication of evaluation findings. So our reviewed approach now, also I've spoke, to, I've, I've, uh, I spoke about latching onto the planning framework. We've got a gender responsive guideline as well because one of the findings was that our evaluations are not gender responsive. So we responded by developing a guideline. Uh, with the partnership with Duendembele. Uh, we are also working on building internal capacity to do some of the evaluations internally rather than having them commissioned uh, all the time. So that might take a while because that, that, that needs more people actually. So, but we're working on that. So we're also testing a DPME driven model in terms of selecting evaluations. So. Previously, the departments selected the evaluations. We took them through a, a criteria. Then we decide whether they go on the national evaluation plan. But now we want to just see if we can flex our muscle a little bit without, with, with, you know, without breaking the relations and without being seen to be forcing evaluations as a top top-down approach because we need to really be responsive. We've got, we've got some critical issues that are happening and we saw that some of the evaluations were just making it without necessarily being responsive. So we're going to test that out. We're starting that next year and we will see how departments are going to respond to it. But as part of testing that, we've also then decided to fund some of the evaluations, 100% funding, which was not our model. Our model was co-funding, but now we are trying to fund it 100%, hoping that with 100% funding, plus us selecting the evaluation and then agreeing with the department, then we can, we can get away with that approach. Um, so, do I still have time? Okay, so, so some lessons, let, may, maybe two lessons that I must say I've, I've drawn from, from how we've worked. Uh, and people usually ask, so how do you guys get it done? How do you do it? So champions, I find, are very critical in, in the evaluation process. You just have to find the champion. You have to find those people who people listen to. And you find them in departments. You find the, min the ministers. Even if it's not your own minister, we've had a very good relationship with the member of parliament, for example, who, who's not, you know, who's not even... Uh, a, a, a sitting uh, minister to be our champion. We call on those people to come and do our opening, our openings at the evaluation seminars. They do our openings when we do the courses. So champions have driven this process as, as, as much as, um, and taken it to where it's at. Um, that's all, thank you. Thanks so much there, Knox. Uh, just a couple of things that jumped out at me was the importance of evaluating your own evaluation system and a theme that I've heard in the conference elsewhere is the importance of thinking more about gender. We're, they're not being, we're not integrating gender fully into the evaluation systems that we work on. So next I'm handing over to the Kingdom of Lesotho. Yes, if you'd like to. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Just to remind you, my name is Ma. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, just to remind you this afternoon, my name is Madina Osbuhudi. I'm coming from the kingdom of Lesotho. Uh, like South Africa, we are just going to present uh, the, our experience in the evolution of the evaluations in the kingdom. Uh, just a little background on the country, you know, Lesotho is uh, situated in the southern African region, 
we are actually surrounded by South Africa, which is our only uh, nearest neighbor. We are a constitutional monarchy. We have the king, and then we have a democratically elected uh, prime minister, and our population is uh, around 2 million. And yeah, that's that. Thank you. Uh, in Lesotho, the MNE concept really came into uh, seriousness in the year of uh, 2008 when we realized that as a country there wasn't any reporting or evaluation that was done specifically uh, during the MDG's implementation. So with the support of the joint UNCT and other development partners, we undertook um, uh, we did a capacity analysis uh, for the statistics and the monitoring and evaluation to, to see if we will be able to monitor and report on the progress that is made on the vision 2020 of the country, the poverty reduction strategy, and the UN agenda at that time. And this led to us developing the national monitoring and evaluation systems and also the statistical capacities that uh, were going together with the MNE. And during that period, we were able to uh, introduce the DEF Info, which was a, a system that was responding to the demand for information and analysis, specifically for poverty monitoring. And uh, this is a system that was supported by the development partners. And one of the lessons that we have learned from that is that uh, it only continued during the time of the uh, support of the development partners, which means it was never institutionalized and uh, it left us vulnerable in terms of information management. And during this time, we have also realized that other national agendas as like uh, the decentralization is critical. And this led us to development of the uh, decentralization policy in order to uh, uh, accelerate the implementation of development programs uh, in the nation. We further then uh, developed our first national strategic development plan, which was running from 2012-13 to 2016-17. And that was... Uh, That was the National Strategic Development Plan 1, as we had called it. And uh, we, as a result of that plan, we developed the monitoring and evaluation guidelines that had clear institutional arrangements. But uh, the challenge that we had with the guidelines, though they were adopted by the cabinet, there was never any uh, real uh, setup of those uh, structures and this had weakened the functionality of the systems. Despite all, all that ch those challenges, we managed to produce the um, MDG's report, of course, with the support from the UNDP. And we also uh, undertook the review of the National Strategic Development Plan as we have been preparing to develop the second plan. And one of the things that uh, we realized of as lessons from those review, two reviews is that there was an insufficient integration of the Millennium Development Goals into the national and the sectoral policies and strategies. Uh, another lesson that we learned it was that there was a weak monitoring and evaluation uh, system, especially in the development and establishment of the baselines and we know that if we do not have the baselines at the beginning of implementation, it gives us a, a bit of a challenge to be able to track progress nor even evaluate uh, what have been achieved. And we had a number of an unfinished business that was identified within the MDGs. Apart from that, we realized uh, during that implementation the need to develop the national strategy for development of statistics. And uh, that is the... A, the strategy that we are currently reviewing in order to respond to the uh, implementation of the SDGs and the National Strategic Development Tool. 
uh, the initiatives that we are currently undertaking in order to strengthen our monitoring and evaluation, we realized that during the implementation of the first plan that there was no clear linkages between the results and the implementation that was taking place. Hence, we invested, uh, uh, we, uh, we invested in training the ministries on the result-based management before we started the new plan. And the development of the NSDP2, which is the plan that we started uh, implementing uh, starting in 2018, then in this time around, we employed the theory of change in the development of the plan, including the monitoring framework thereof. We also integrated the unfinished business of the MDGs, and we took into consideration the, the sustainable development goals. We further developed the baseline report for the sustainable development goals as we, I had alluded to that uh, in the MDGs, we never established the baselines. So this time around, we decided that we should invest in establishing the baselines first. And those baselines are, are made uh, with trends that goes as back as five years before 2016. And it has, uh, uh, in that, we have selected 152 indicators and we only have data for 53% of those uh, SDG indicators. And among the selected uh, SDG indicators, we have 34 that we customized. And this means the ones that we have customized to some extent uh, suffer uh, disaggregation. Uh, symptom there, in particular for on the issues of disability, on the issues of employment status and the wealth status. And this all also renders vulner vulnerable to leaving some people behind because if our indicators, as we start as a baseline, they don't include such people uh, in the disaggregation, it means we might miss an opportunity to, to uh, respond to their needs. Uh, this has also uh, helped us to strengthen our in, uh, uh, institutions and uh, set some champions, like my South African and, uh, counterpart has just said. We had established uh, as a nation the Parliament SDGs Committee. There is an SDG committee for both the National Assembly and the Senate, and currently we are working on capacitating uh, the committees and they have started to have joint sittings in order to have uh, the joint reviews of, on, of the progress on the implementation of the development plans, including the SDGs. Uh, we also have a development coordination structure that, is, that has the prime minister as the one that is the highest, and it also links with the parliament, and it has the other sectoral uh, uh, legs in it. And this year, in 2019, after we had realized that we had uh, adopted the baseline report, we decided that we should uh, undertake uh, the voluntary national review so that we see how we are doing and how we compare with other countries. And this has also led to strengthening of our structures on the ground. And we also started implementing the National Strategic Development Plan and took uh, the big fast results approach uh, that is uh, led by Malaysia and we had invited them to support us uh, in order to accelerate the implementation of the National Strategic Development to priority projects. And we have been, uh, for the first time as a country, sitting together with the private sector because we have realized that at the beginning that our unemployment rate is very high. So we believe that private sector has a big role to play. So we decided that the big fast result approach will be uh, of importance to our country. So we have been working with private sector. Private sector has indicated uh, what are the responsibilities of the government that can help them to unlock their potential projects and investments? So it is the process that we are currently uh, doing. In as far as uh, a funding of the funding of the 
evaluation in my conclusion. We have realized that in, the, in our country, a lot of resources are being uh, put into the planning, but there isn't much that is uh, uh, given for uh, monitoring and reporting or the evaluation. So sometimes it, it makes us to continue repeating some things that do not work. So we believe if we can, uh, going forward, if we can invest more in the evaluation of the projects and the programs, it, this will be very helpful because the, uh, the projects that are supported by donors, you will find that they are the only ones that are evaluated and they are evaluated within the sectors, though the Ministry of Development Planning is coordinating the national m and &E system because of the culture that was done before because our departments was just established in 2009. So they, con they still continue the way they used to work and you find that they do the evaluation that are also donor driven and this uh, makes us to be vulnerable in such a way that they are not, there's no learning, there's no uh, learning that we, we can learn from the evaluation results and hence they do not inform uh, our policies to some extent. So uh, I think I would say thank you at this moment. Thank you very much. Um, some interesting points to come out there. The transition from MDGs to SDGs. The role of the parliament in trying to look at for the, towards the parliament. And then the important point at the end there about how we start to transition from a donor-led system to one which works with for the country and for the country's needs. I'm going to hand over now to Mr. Tobolov from uh, Tajikistan for our third presentation. Good afternoon, everybody, again. Uh, uh, I'm going to say that uh, thank you for the, this, uh, this um, chance for me, they have taken chance for me that uh, I have taken part to this conference and uh, thanks again to the organizers. So I'm going to present uh, about the SDG indicators. Uh, at present, uh, assessing the statistical potential of the Republic of Tajikistan for monitoring indicators of uh, global SDG indicators is one of the periodic talks of statistical agency. The agency for statistical is considered the main source of data of collects and information from each source as well as from other administrative source which are managed by ministries and departments. The main body of data, primary quantity, disaggregated by age, sex, age, will be provided by the Agency for Statistics under the President of the Republic of Tajikistan. Um, uh, here is we have a key national data source from monitoring SDG. Uh, the first state statistical observation on social demographic issues. Uh, the second uh, uh, continuous monitoring on small and uh, uh, medium sized business. The third population on housing census. Uh, the first sample household budget survey. The fifth uh, labor force survey and medical demography research administrative and ministry departments. Uh, uh, here's also we have actual talks for statistical authorities, organization, integration of SDG indicators into the statistical work program, uh, intelligence coordination, uh, establishment of the SDG data follow process with the touch start, uh, also statistical development of the methodology and uh, method for collecting data on SDG indicators. Uh, also disaggregation of data by income, gender, age, race, and scene, and migration st st status, uh, disability, geographical location. Um, 
Here is also a collection of regional data on SDG 168 region of the Republic of Tajikistan. Uh, action plan here is uh, statistical equation, extend statistical survey, especially in the field, social statistic, use administrative and uh, Establish in national in inter uh, agency work gro working group of single co coordinating body in for SDG indicators defined web portal. Establish interagency collaboration. Prepare country report uh, on SDG indicators taken on account of national regional targets. <clears throat> and assist. Uh, an assist of uh, the potential for uh, determined global SDG indicators for Tajikistan was carried out for all 272 uh, uh, SDG indicators agreed with uh, the 48th uh, session of the United Nations Statistical uh, Commission, with the exception, exception of 13 indicators, are not uh, uh, applicable uh, to Tajikistan. As we have the developing of the national indicators for the uh, implementation of the SDGs in December 2017, uh, SPRITS, uh, with the technical, technical support of UNDP, developed by and uh, approved uh, a, a road damp for the implementation of the action plan for improving the national syst statistical system of the Republic of Tajikistan. For the period 2018-2020, the main purpose of which is to develop and improve the M&E of the NDS 2030 based on the SDG inventory, the SDG indicators. Identify priority talks as well as the development of the work for monitoring SDG indicators, establishment uh, cooperation with respect uh, response uh, representative of various authorities to achieve a um, monitor and in SDG indicators. Uh, here is uh, we have a development of national in the indicators for the implementation of the SDG. Uh, currently work on national to uh, nationalize on SDG uh, uh, in, uh, is still uh, ongoing and assessment was made of the completeness of statistical indicators in the context of their availability, not only in general, but also at disaggregate level. Uh, administrative data source uh, represent uh, an important potential of monitoring the SDG whose share in the total number of the indicators about 60% administrative source are data uh, annually produced by such ministries and uh, ministries of labor, ministry uh, migration and employment. The Ministry of Education and Science, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, the Ministry of uh, Cultura, Culture, and uh, in the Ministry of Energy and Water Economy, the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, the Ministry of the Interior and uh, other departments. Um, an analysis of data accessibility by uh, ablest and uh, stakeholders indicators uh, indicates uh, that uh, 161 SDG indicators are the disposal of data holders or those uh, institutions that uh, are responsible for monitoring and evaluating the SDG. Therefore, it uh, necessary to lead the separation of the talk uh, and the efficient use to resource in the implementation and monitoring of the SDG. 
uh, here is uh, in all exciting SDG indicators relevant to the Republic of Tajikistan that leading produce of indicators is a statistical agency which is responsible for the production of 46 indicators of which 19 are the economic fault, 19 in the social sphere, and 5 in the energy fault, and uh, uh, 3 in the fault of right and uh, management. Here's capacity building. Um, to, uh, here's donors, donor support in improving national for the reporting of uh, platform SDG. Uh, uh, yeah, I have additional information about here uh, that uh, in evaluation uh, now <coughs> now we have done uh, 101 SDG indicators nationalized, and uh, uh, here is NDS National Development System. We have done 78 percent in the, is uh, aligned with SDGs. Uh, so. Now we are working uh, with group by uh, sectors, including the, on no one left behind. Uh, um, on evaluation, we have done uh, three, three years. We have done uh, in 2000, in 2070 voluntary. Uh, we have done in, in 2070 voluntary national reviews. Uh, in 2018, we have done national report on SDG. Uh, in 2019, we are uh, working with groups uh, about uh, reviewing the SDG implement implementation for period of forms. Uh, thanks for attention. Thank you for that. Some uh, very interesting information there, especially on the evolution of the system, how they are gathering more indicators, and also some thoughts around switching from from more statistics-led data, statistical agency data, set to data sets to how you could potentially use administrative sources. So thank you for that presentation. Now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Heber for the final presentation. Just to warn you, at the end of this presentation, our presenters are going to come down to different areas of the front here to be able to have an interactive question and answer. So if you want to ask questions, you're going to have to move towards the front. And then our presenters will rotate between different areas. All you'd have to do is move once towards the front, and then our presenters will rotate between you. We're always looking to have a bit more interaction with these sessions. So. We're doing that just after this presentation of uh, okay. our esteemed Dr. Heber. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my presentation will tackle the issue of the, the role of think tanks uh, in evaluating SDGs. Uh, as I'm academic, first of all, I will start with what is think tanks. Uh, think tanks is a resource center. However, not all resource centers are think tanks. It should. Uh, support to oriented to the decision making process. It should support decision makers, and it uh, should work on public policy. And if you can manage a new, uh, or can see in your uh, country, not all resource centers work on public policy. Maybe they work on special uh, ideas that is out uh, of the interest of the decision makers. Also, it to produce policy papers. Which uh, this is the gap of research center. Not all research center can have the tool to produce policy paper and policy brief. So the think tanks should work mainly uh, to be oriented to the decision makers. Uh, concerning the affiliation of think tanks, think tanks can be a governmental body, can be uh, uh, affiliated to the political party, it can be affiliated to the university, or it can be independent uh, or a quasi government. So this is a think tank. And think tank definition, you can find that. Uh, it's very important to know that uh, it should be uh, independent. Independent and this independency is relative. It should be independent according to the law, uh, according to its agenda, and according to its money or fund. So here you can find the th three groups or three uh, circles of uh, how to draft national plans of 2030. You can find the uh, uh, 
now we are talking all since the, the first day of the conference, we talk about how to localize SDGs. And now it's a role of think tanks. Think tanks can work in drafting national plan 2030. It can work on uh, the execution or implementation of the plan and also the evaluation of the plan. And you can find that the role of think tanks concerning monitoring and evaluation is a cross-cutting for the three uh, uh, pillars in drafting and execution and evaluation. Here you can find uh, in this um, uh, table, you can find the role of think tanks. It's completely uh, different than we can uh, think. It's not only oriented to policy paper or policy uh, research. However, it can uh, work on setting development priorities. It can take different types, like a spotlight on the severe problems in society, or maybe it's existed or in the future. Also, it can gather uh, the required information around uh, each problem, and it can set policy alternatives, and it can also do a cost and benefit analysis for each alternative, and it can determine the priority for the decision makers. Also, it can create credibility. Uh, if you are talking about the people consent, we need to have the partnership of think tanks. So it helped in gathering data and checking data and uh, resource reliability, and also checking the, the linkage between data, checking the connection between SDGs and the implementation of national plans. Concerning uh, capacity building, and I think capacity building is a, an important issue uh, because it's a problem of many countries, uh, um, uh, especially in, uh, in Asia and Africa. So think tanks can provide or can uh, um, fill this gap by providing evaluators. Uh, it can be, if you know that, the term of revolving doors. It can provide evaluators and it can also uh, recruit evaluators who was working in the bureaucratic uh, M&E agency. Also, it can uh, provide a TOT for evaluators, and also it can provide a master degree for evaluators. Uh, also, it can strengthen the institutional strategies that support the skills of policy uh, actors. The, the fourth uh, issue of think tanks, or fourth role, think tank, think, do tank, an approach toward special issues. Uh, think tank can be an implementer, implementer uh, in M&E. As you can see that we now talk about, we don't leave, no, we want to, uh, uh, to achieve that, no, leaving no one behind. Leaving no one behind needs uh, a catalyst who can implement. So think tanks can implement in social inclusion uh, in, in order to make sure that all people are inclusive. It can implement uh, during disputes and know that the, the, the reasons uh, for uh, people are margin marginalized. It can also work in narrowing the gap by track to diplomacy. Uh, it can also be a channel for political participation and also for inclusive economic development. Uh, the uh, uh, sixth role of think tanks, it can raise awareness of the people in order to build the uh, human consent by creating evidence-based awareness about past, present, future development priorities and trajectories. Also, it can hold con uh, constructive uh, dialogue regarding country position vis-a-vis -vis post-2015 uh, agenda. And also, it can set the implementation uh, evaluation plans for evaluation culture. And this is very important to build an evaluation culture in the society. Also, it can help in building societal common consent on SDGs. In addition to assessing the, and communicate groundbreaking ideas. The last uh, uh, role of think tanks in M&E, enhance M&E partnership. Uh, we have a problem that not all the people are included in M&E. So it's a role of uh, think tanks when they are, we are uh, talking about conference, seminars, etc., to have a, a partnership with the parliament and the political parties, with academia, with the private sector, with the civil society, and with individuals to enhance the public accountability and to achieve public consent. Here you can find the methodology. Uh, as I'm uh, an academic, so I'm concerned with the methodology. What are the tools that think tanks can, can use in M&E? Think tanks can use, uh, uh, for, uh, it can also use evidence-based contribution products uh, through indicators of uh, um, how to approach with the parliament. And also it can uh, use an advocacy plan and advocacy planning. It also can use public policy tools uh, in M&E. It also can use um, hearings. It can use study visits. Uh, also, it can use, uh, um, uh, in the first day, I mentioned uh, a new word from the lady from Finland. She talked about the phenomena based approach that is uh, done by Helsinki Think Tank. And this is new methodology. Uh, we can work on it to, to elaborate more in Think Tank's uh, tools. 
Think tanks can improve the intellectual framework of decision making by interesting new ideas into policy debate and SDGs implementation on local level. And this is a very important uh, uh, mission for think tanks if we need to rethink about. Uh, what's the tool of uh, think tanks and M&E? Uh, advocacy campaign. Uh, every think tank should work on advocacy campaign and, uh, and it's very important to how to address decision makers by right policy briefs and can use media and also can use news, uh, uh, um, talk shows uh, and newspapers. It can be invited inside hearings. Also it can, be, uh, it can hold um, a conference, forums, seminars, symposiums. Uh, it can organize a study visits for successful think tanks. And a very important tool that is an organic intellectual, that people who are working inside think tanks and they are joining the bureaucrats or the government uh, in order to be uh, uh, an implementer for uh, M&E. Also, the dialogue uh, around data to select goals and uh, targets. And the very important issue is the role of think tanks, uh, our network of think tanks. As you know, that uh, think tanks in the global arena have different networks, uh, uh, like GDN, that is uh, uh, organized by uh, World Bank. Uh, also, uh, like um, uh, um, ACPF, that is organized in Africa. Uh, we have different uh, network of think tanks. Now, if we have um, a think tanks uh, and M&E process, what can we expect? What's the impact? The impact of think tanks is first to narrow the gap uh, towards a special uh, sectoral issues uh, of think tanks mechanism like uh, uh, gender issues like uh, poverty. Also, it can support a new global network of think tanks SDGs. Uh, this, uh, uh, there is also a network of think tanks SDGs. This network is supported by IDRC, it's a Canadian think tank. Also, it's sh to share best practices and lessons learned uh, on SDGs implementation, and this, this, this is very important, can be to have a forum like that that you are in. Uh, also, to improve the learning, uh, evaluating strategies and capacities, and to achieve and tracing SDGs progress, and also to achieve the consensus of the people because uh, it's a part of uh, the M&E credibility, and to help in integrating SDGs in, into national development plans, and to provide uh, uh, and uh, popular Arise SDGs, and this is very important that the people can think in the culture of uh, M&E and SDGs inside the society, and also can uh, reach to uh, um, sectoral common consensus on SDGs, and also to uh, have um, an embedded culture of SDGs inside the society. And if we can uh, achieve this uh, point. I think uh, SDGs can be implemented uh, because the people will, pick, uh, to, will have a consensus about SDGs. Finally, my last message is that a process, uh, SDGs, it's a process that requires all hands on deck. We cannot just black think tanks into equation to say that uh, they might fix all the problems. No, think tanks can't work alone. Think tanks need all partners and actors to work together to achieve SDGs in order not to find anyone left behind. And thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eber. I think you raised really good issues around the complementary role that think tanks can play within national evaluation systems. For example, supporting advocacy, bringing in a broader range of inclusion, and bringing an intellectual frame for policy to help think issues through. So, what we're going to do, so, come forward <laughs> if you'd like to interact with our speakers. I'm going to ask our colleague from Tajikistan to go to this area over here, Knox, come down here, a bit in the middle, and Lesotho, just off to the right here, off the right centre, and then Dr. Heber, go to the area around there. So, our presenters are going to come down to the floor and be able to interact with you. We've asked some of our interpreters to also help and come to the tables so that they're able to help interpret some of the issues. So this is your opportunity to ask questions. After about five, six minutes or so, I'm going to ask presenters to rotate so that you don't have to move, they're going to move around you. Okay, so this is an opportunity for increased interaction. So.
so yeah, just to over to that. Maybe a little over there, then we'll bring the C2 here and Knox there. Okay. The C2 guys come a little bit. Dr. Heber. Oh, you got to you got to go to these guys here. Okay. Knox, could you sit, sit down in the middle and have people form around you? 